Okay, we are live. This is Dr. Michael K from the Center for Functional Health, and welcome everybody. Tonight, I have the honor of interviewing Dr. Efri Germanis. Dr. Germanis, welcome to tonight. I've been looking forward to our conversation. We had a great conversation before when you were kind of to invite me on to your gut summit. Uh, we went for a while there, and I hope we can deliver a lot of great information like we did there here tonight. So welcome, welcome. I hope you had a wonderful day. I did, and thank you for having me. Uh, it was great con conversing with you during the Gut Summit as well. I learned so much from you, even just when we were just having an easy talk about you know visceral somatic health and back pain, and not all back pain is back pain. And um, I'm happy to be here with you and your your audience. So thank you for having me. Excellent. So let's jump into it. You are a naturopath. You yes. are an acupuncture. You do homeopathy. So let's share with everybody what those practices are and the differences. Sure. So uh, naturopathic medicine um, approaches healthcare or the person's health from the whole, right? The whole body. Um, and so naturopathic healthcare or naturopathic medicine, we utilize very, very many different modalities, which sometimes does include homeopathy. Uh, and in Ontario does include acupuncture as a modality that we're able to utilize with our patients. Uh, but the idea here is we are trying to understand our patients overall health and wellness and what has brought them in with that health concern, whatever it may be. Um, and we'll investigate understanding the person's symptoms, um, their health history, their health goals. If we need to, we can do testing. And that can include some your basic lab work, but also additional testing um, from stool testing to hormone testing, uh, food sensitivity testing, whatever we feel that that patient needs to investigate further should we need to. Um, and so we just look at a whole the whole system and we approach it from all aspects. So in, in the way I practice naturopathic medicines, I look at the whole person on the spiritual level, on the psychological level, on their physical, uh, as well as their um, internal system. So we're, we're looking at all systems of the body. And so with treatment protocols, uh, in terms of, you know, dealing with whatever health concern, we're going to address it from all aspects, not just something simple. It could be, but we're going to address lifestyle. We're going to address uh, mood and stress. We're going to address the way people eat the food they eat, um, everything from top to bottom or bottom to top, whichever way people like to be in, in their direction of health. Um, with acupuncture, it's, it's a similar system in terms of treating the whole. Um, and with acupuncture, it's about the balance of yin and yang. And so these are the two energies that we have. And yin and yang fluctuates throughout the day, right? Morning to night, night to morning. Um, and the same idea is we're trying to uh, balance the whole. So from the inside to the outside or from the outside to the inside. And so we're looking at what we call this channel and collateral system. And this is kind of a way that we observe whether there's a dysfunction within the channels, the collaterals, if there's a tr trouble within the organ or the Zong Fu system. Um, and so our main goal is to balance yin and yang or chi and blood so that a person can live uh, at their optimal, right? Without any problems with stress or sleep or digestion or energy or pain, whatever the situation, acupuncture can address all aspects of health. And so it's just, it's a really great way to integrate. And I, I truly love, you know, using naturopathic medicine with that, that investigation, testing, understanding a patient's symptoms, being able to sit with them for an hour, an hour and a half, and really get to know that person on a whole level, and then utilizing modalities within acupuncture that can also support ongoing as we're doing different treatment protocols. Excellent. So I remember learning a little bit about acupuncture with respect to meridian lines and governing lines, correct? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times patients ask, you know, should I try acupuncture? I am always open to it. And the question I get, well, how does sticking a needle in me help my gut? Right. So let's <laughs> talk about that. Right. Because the thought process is like, you're sticking a bunch of needles in there. It really doesn't mean anything. Just throw them in there wherever you want. But let's talk about somebody presents with say irritable bowel syndrome uh, with diarrhea. So IBSD common presentation, both in your clinic and my clinic. Um, I don't do acupuncture from an acupuncture perspective. How would you look at that? And why does sticking a needle 
at certain areas, certain points, acupuncture points, helps that person with IBS? So yeah, for, for a situation like IBS, it's interesting because from a Chinese medicine perspective, we don't really look at it from that disease. Now, the disease itself or whatever we want to describe the disorder as, as IBS, but in Chinese medicine, we're looking at the balances, like I said, yin and yang. And so if a patient's coming in complaining of symptoms, like you said, more of the loose stools, there's probably some fatigue, there's some indigestion, there's some bloating, they don't do well with a lot of foods or certain food groups if they've determined. So we're seeing some picture of indigestion and digestive distress. So in Chinese medicine, we have, as you said, the meridians, or we call it channels as well, there's 12 meridians or 12 channels, and they represent the 12 main organs six of which we see as these yin organs and six of which are yang. So there's just a different energetic presence with these organs, uh, the yin being more vital. Um, and if you want to look at five element, we can also see these relationships. So spleen and stomach would be the two main organs I would be thinking about when we're thinking about an IBS picture. And so they work together. And I know when we say spleen, people are like, oh my goodness, my spleen has a problem. It's a different approach that we're used to in terms of the spleen, what we think of in Western perspective. In Chinese medicine, the spleen and stomach work together to break down the food and drink that we consume. Um, and so the stomach is just that emulsifier. It's breaking food down into smaller particles. And then the spleen is taking that nourishment and making qi and blood. And so things like the foods we eat, the stresses we encounter, uh, overworking, over overthinking, uh, um, stress itself, uh, inactivity or overactivity can start to deplete the spleen. And so we start to see symptoms of what we call like spleen chi deficiency. And so this would be loose stool, fatigue, lassitude, distension or um, bloating of the abdomen or the stomach, possibly upward movement of stomach chi, so nausea and vomiting and so on. Um, and so what we're going to do now is choose needles that are going to help soothe that or nourish that channel pathway. And so we put needles in the body, but they're in specific areas of the body that are going to support the function of the spleen, the function of the stomach, nourishment of the body. And so throughout the body, we have each channel or each meridian has a certain number of points and it's on a certain area of the body and it's actually bilateral. So it's mirror imaging. So we have a right and left side, even though we only have one spleen and one stomach, we still have two channels. Um, and so by needling these points, just like if you are changing the food you eat, you're making a change within the body because it is bringing in an energy and activating the channel. And the channel we can think of is just like your cardiovascular system, your nervous system, right? There is uh, an effect within the system. So we activate this point and we can release endorphins, we can have a change on neurotransmitters, we can uh, support the function because it's activating the spleen at a deeper level, also at a superficial level. So these points have been found through, and it, it just, it always, it, may, it amazes me how these points were found back, you know, years and years ago in China when they were doing studies and seeing people's symptoms and needling and seeing the changes. And that's how they determined this channel collateral system. So it's just really intriguing. Interesting. So when you're looking at somebody, so somebody presents, that means the clinical presentation makes you think, you know, the spleen, the stomach, and so let's say somebody comes in with gastroparesis, which is a, you know, that's a, that's a tough clinical presentation. Does that often overlap with the other kinds of presentation with gut or every time you look at it from acupuncture, it's something a little bit different. It could, it could be very similar and there could be slight differences because we're understanding the person's constitution as well. We're trying to understand, are they in an excess state? Are they in a deficient state? Um, you know, with chronic dysfunctions too, like IBS, we start to see, you know, the onion layers. There's a lot more than just the digestive distress that's present. That's the main, the main symptom that might be bothersome or it might be the main reason they're coming in but we start to see different aspects. And just as we approach, you know, functional medicine or naturopathic medicine approaches, we understand that there's interactions of these systems. 
And so just because maybe it's a spleen and stomach, we're still going to have, I might still look at the liver and gallbladder as a, a symptom or a system that I would treat as well, because there is a relationship where the liver and gallbladder can become stronger and attack the spleen and stomach when we look at it like five element approach. Or I might go and say, hey, I need to support the parent portion of these organs to bring nourishment to the child if we think about this generating cycle. Um, so if you've ever seen five elements, right, it's, it's your wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And so there's a generating cycle and there's also a conflicting or uh, um, attacking cycle. I always forget that name, but, um, you know, when something is weak, something else gets stronger. And so we want to keep that balance. And, and so we're going to not just treat spleen and stomach, but we're going to approach it for what that patient presents. And one key distinction that's very different from a lot of ways that we treat even in naturopathic medicine is we look at the tongue and the pulse. So a person's pulse can give us an idea of their yin or their blood, uh, their yang or their chi, uh, the organs in the upper and middle and lower jaw. So if we think like chest, middle abdomen and lower abdomen. And then the tongue, it really tells us, you know, is there heat in the body? Is there dampness in the body? Uh, is there dryness? These pathogens that change our, our, our foundations and create dysfunctions like pain, indigestion, bloating, and other similar symptoms. Interesting. So have you had cases where people have come in and maybe you've done uh, either blood work or GI maps, something like that, um, did strictly acupuncture redid the test and then you find a different outcome. So maybe I've misunderstood your question. So the testing is showing one thing, but then. No, testing is showing, you know, X, Y, Z, whether yeah. we have, you know, uh, overgrowth of bacteria, undergrowth of bacteria. Um, maybe we have an elevated cow protecting indicative of inflammation. And then you do acupuncture, redo the test. And then you see those numbers actually come back down to a norm. I haven't had the benefit of doing some pre and post tests like like that. However, I have seen I've had some patients where um, we've seen some sensitivity or intolerances to foods. And so we'll do a gut healing protocol that I utilize with my clients and my patients. And then I do acupuncture as they're going through the phases of elimination and reintroduction and doing the supplementation. Um, and what I find is they do really well with the gut healing protocol, but then when I integrate acupuncture, it's 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 as if you're turning on a light switch and things right. are just moving so much better. Like I had a patient once tell me, you know, I didn't know I could have such amazing bowel movements because of acupuncture. And it was simply some points that we're doing specific to help with normalcy of bowel movements. Interesting. Yeah. So it seems like it just definitely expedites the process. So, it, you know, it's an injunct procedure. It works wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about how it, acupuncture can be incorporated with the vagus nerve, right? Because we know a lot of our gut patients that come in, they have vagal tone issues. So can we talk a little bit about what you do when you see that and how acupuncture plays a role? Well, with acupuncture, one of the major pieces is that you know, there are kind of some theories and I'm actually teaching on the pain management component right now with acupuncture. And one of the things I introduced this week, which would go for anything, right? When we talk about gut health or even pain or mental, emotional dysfunctions, there is a nervous component to its actions. What we see is by even needling, we're having an effect onto the endorphins being secreted by the body. And we're having an effect on neurotransmitter releases as well as balance. And so what we're seeing is, and again, we also see not only that endorphin release, but we see changes with blood pressure. We see changes um, with uh, heart rate. So we can see that, you know, I don't know if I have a direct correlation that I've seen in practice with the vagus nerve, but we're seeing a direct correlation that it's affecting the nervous system within the body. And so choosing points that are going to support, you know, spleen or stomach or digestion, we can still see that some of the points or the channels correspond to how the vagus nerve comes down through the body in terms of its directionality. It, I, I find that sometimes it does overlap like our stomach channel mm -hmm. pathway that runs down the chest and, and um, as we'll say midway. 
so mammillary line. Um, and, and so I find that while I may not have that answer for direct for vagus nerve, I do see a direct correlation into the nervous system. It's very calming. It helps with the kind of gut brain connection. Cause again, the needles themselves are sending that message up to the brain and that brain is coming back and responding down into that system wherever the needle is located. Excellent. Can you share a little bit about, and I'm sure like a lot of people have seen this on specials, moxibustion, that's how I say moxibustion, correct? Can yeah. you share about that? So moxibustion is one of the tools we can utilize. Um, and so with moxibustion, what we tend to think of its use is in cases where we have a yang deficiency or qi deficiency, and there's a lot of cold within the body. So that could be something like a chronic dysfunction in the system uh, for years where now the body has become very deficient. And we can see some what of like a yang collapse. We can see in postpartum disorders with uh, with a newly new moms who've just given birth. There's a lot of deficiency that can happen. Uh, but moxibustion itself is using this moxibustion powder that heats the system. And there are specific points that we can utilize. One of the main points that we you can use it anywhere technically, but one of the main points that we see used a lot is right in the belly button. So your umbilicus. Um, that one point cannot be needled, but we can do moxibustion. We can add ginger, we can add garlic, we can add salt, and then you can do either direct or indirect moxibustion. So if it's directly on the skin or just above it. Um, other ways that we can use moxibustion is when you have the needle inserted, you can actually put a little moxibustion uh, piece on top of the, the handle and have it lit so it heats the needle, so it drives in heat. So it's very warming and invigorating, especially in cases of a, a young deficiency. Interesting. So what about GERD? I mean, we have a lot of patients that come in with reflux. Yes. And my wife has suffered with reflux, something vicious. And we that's when we were introduced to homeopathy. I was working with a traditionally trained homeopathic physician in California. And, you know, he, he gave her arsenic. And it was my first introduction to it. You know, you know, arse, oh, my God. I mean, what are we doing now? At that time, she tried every other medication there was anyway that could cause some real damage. And, you know, I'd say within one week, it was like 75% gone, two weeks gone after suffering for over a year. So can you talk a little bit how homeopathy actually works? So homeopathy is a very... Um interesting medicine it's very it's energetically based um and so we have to understand that it's like treats like and so um for example if you get a bee sting right we're going to use apis which is bee venom to treat it because a bee sting if you remember if you've ever got i've never gotten stung by a bee thankfully but i've seen it it's red it's hot it's painful so it apis has those types of characteristics um, I actually love our Seneca album if I travel anywhere. So if I pick up anything while traveling, like from the food or just the travel itself, it's a fantastic homeopathic remedy for any type of stomach disturbance. Um, and so if there's like a uh, loose stool or constipation or abdominal pain or GERD, any of those symptomologies that can happen, at random on trips because you know we're we're exposed a little bit more more i feel always our body relaxes so we get a little bit more vulnerable um i i love our Senecum album but the idea with these remedies and i i do use them i don't use them constitutionally too much in terms of you know treating a constitutional deficiency or issue i treat them more using in acute stages so i use a lot for rolled ankles or injuries like your arnica, your leadum, your ruta for like your rusty hinges, like your, your joint pain. Um, but the idea here is that these were determined that we use the same thing that causes the problem in a sense to treat the problem. And we don't, it's not to override the body, it's kind of to nudge it in the right way. And so that energy that's coming in and in essence, your pellets that you use really don't have any medicine in them. Through succussions, the energetic force of what's in there changes within the body, it's energies, because we are just a big ball of energy technically, if we want to think about what our, our human body truly is deep down. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the way of I approach and describe homeopathy. Um, and and just it's it's phenomenal it can work for many and it may not work for all 
and there's occasionally sometimes where we just don't see any responses. I remember the doc I was working with would go in the back and have his tinctures and drop it in the with the little pellets and stuff like that. So something definitely is, is I guess it goes on the pellet and that's how it's absorbed because you put it underneath yeah. your tongue. So he was making his own medicine. Is it safe just to like, you know, I have X condition, go out to the health food store and just look at the chart and buy what's ever there? Do you, is that okay? With homeopathy, there, you know, it is a safe medicine, but you know, at the same time, I always re recommend if you're dealing with issues, um, it's really great to sit down with somebody because, you know, I remember when I was learning homeopathy, I thought I had every disease that every remedy had. So it can get really confusing really fast because I was like, well, I'm this remedy and this remedy and this remedy. So it, it, it's really interesting because as much as we'd love to go to the store, pull down the little, the, the pull tab and say, okay, I have these symptoms, we may or may not get a response. Um, there are certain times where we might use something short term. There's times where we want something long term. And sometimes if we high dose homeopathic medicine, you can actually prove the remedy so you can make it come true. Mm. So there are cases where we do want to be careful just as much as they're sugar pills in a sense. And I don't like using that term. Um, energetically, they can still change within the, the body within. And sometimes our responses do take months. Constitutionally, it, you may not see changes right away. It could take, you know, you do one dose and it could take three, four months before you see a change. Interesting. So with a lot of times people come in with medications, they'll take in uh, Bentol, they'll take Imodium, uh, they're on Rifaximin. So with any of those, is, is homeopathic remedies contradicted in, in using that with medicine? They're not contraindicated unless there are any specific, I, I'm not aware of any specific medications that I've seen contraindicated. What we always say is you take your medications away from anything else, supplements or homeopathic remedies. However, uh, homeopathic remedies are working on a different level compared to say your medications or even your supplements. Gotcha. So, and is there any time that acupuncture should not be used? There are some cases with acupuncture um, in terms of one, you know, if there's a potential for your patient, female patient to be pregnant, there are some contraindicated points for pregnancy because they can induce labor. Um, we do have some areas of the body. I, I did have a patient in the past with lymphedema. So there's so much swelling and edema um, and fluid in the tissue space that needling that area could cause an infection because you're putting needle into an area that's saturated with fluid right now because of an, under, an underlying condition. Um, otherwise, you know, with electroacupuncture, you're using electrodes, right? We're not going to do anything with pacemakers. So there are certain situations we want to be careful with, but for the most part, um, acupuncture is quite safe. Uh, there are areas we want to be aware of, like when we're needling the chest or the back, that we're not needling in a certain direction to cause any injury to the lungs, for example, or organs, so depth and so on. But um, ideally, for the most part, um, we can needle. The other time that we would want to watch out is also someone who's diabetic, uh, and they have the um, the sensory loss in the limb, so we, they wouldn't be able to tell us if there's any pain or discomfort. And do, is there anything like, you know, if someone's on, you know, Xeralto, you know, Warfarin, Coumadin, they have a, you know, blood disorder and blood thinner, do we have to be cognizant of that? Yeah, you want to be somewhat cognizant because you are penetrating the skin surface. And so we don't just want to cause any bleeding, um, you know, depending on their dose and depending on their health issues. That's something uh, as a practitioner, you would decide the risk uh, with it and decide which is ideal for them in terms of treatment. And have you seen or are seeing, because I know you teach, so are you seeing acupuncture being used for like neurodegenerative disorders? Are you seeing it for like, you know, the Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and stuff like that? There are some, I, I, there are some studies coming out and there are some individuals who are using in that way because we, there, you know, there's, we can do ear acupuncture, which is fantastic, treat the whole body just from the ear. There is also things called scalp acupuncture where we can affect the motor, the sensory, um, the balance, the hearing. So a lot of different areas. I know a lot of practitioners use, I don't see a lot of concussion patients in my clinic, but a lot of practitioners do use um, scalp acupuncture for post-concussion treatments. 
um, I, I would I would see that they can be beneficial because we're not treating Alzheimer's, we're not treating dementia, we're not treating Parkinson, but we're treating what we can from the symptoms associated with it in terms of a syndrome differentiation that we determine from a TCM diagnosis. Excellent. I was looking at your website and can you, I'm going to ask you, I called it Hygieia, <laughs> but let, give me the real pronouncements. How do you pronounce it? So it's Igia Naturopathic Clinic. Okay. And what does, what does Igia, right? Igia? Yeah. Igia. Igia is a Greek word for health. So, uh, yeah. So um, I, ch I chose the chalice with my, um, with my logo for the chalice of health. Uh, I placed the leaf in mine for natural. And yeah, so Ihea was just, it's a, a goddess worked with Asclepius. Um, and so it's just, for some reason, it just stuck with me. You know, you're always wondering, what do you name the clinic? And so right. I somehow just came across it um, and just fell in love with the name and thought this is perfect. Beautiful. And I saw all there on the, on the website that you also address fertility, correct? So, pardon me? You also address fertility? Yeah, so I've been dabbling in fertility. I've had colleagues and um, close uh, co close colleagues who have been dealing with infertility issues. Uh, when I was in school as a student, we did have some fertility patients, which we uh, thankfully were able to help both both parties, um, ideally the female, uh, get pregnant and carry a baby to term. So. Um, fertility or infertility has been a bigger issue that we're seeing more and more. And I, I'm seeing more and more, um, miscarriages happening for patients. Um, and it's been quite, it's been quite helpful because again, we're, we're treating the foundations. We're understanding where that deficiency or where that problem is for that female and, and her partner, um, in terms of one getting pregnant and then also carrying the baby to term. And what is your theory or thought process on why you're seeing more of that fertility issue or infertility or, or why you're seeing more miscarriages? I think a lot of it has to do with our, our current situation, you know, even the last year and a half, sure, with what's going on around the world. But I feel that our, our environment's getting more and more toxic. Our food system is getting more and more toxic and less, nourish, less nourishing. Um, and I, I feel that where a lot of people are go, go, go. There's a lot of exposures to pesticides, to exogenous hormones, to so many sources that we just don't know where they're coming from. And I'm finding that, you know, this maybe 10 years ago, maybe I wasn't, I wasn't in contact with individuals going through this, but I'm finding more and more, I'm hearing more about miscarriages and more about loss and more about infertility issues. And I, I just feel it's our environment and this is where we need to really understand what's going on and how we can take care of our, of our, of our, of our world and our, our mother earth in terms of giving us the nourishment we need. Cause even in Chinese medicine, spleen and stomach are, are the element of earth and earth is the most nourishing. And so if our earth is, uh, dry or deficient or unable to nourish us, what's going to happen to our health? Right. It declines. Yeah. So, so, you know, also with infertility though, I mean, sometimes on the male side of the presentation, we're seeing a lot more of low T, low testosterone. Yeah. Have you found with either nitropathy, homeopathy, acupuncture, or the combination of all three and nutrition as well, that that can help? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I'm addressing, I think a lot of times, both for the, for the male and female addressing the lifestyle, looking at their exposures, looking at their food and drink, looking at their stress levels, um, are one way. Cause again, you know, sleep is not really happening. People are stressed out. Uh, there's no time to relax. There's no time to be present because everyone's just very busy. Um, and it's, it's causing havoc to our hormones. It's causing havoc to our digestive system. And it's just this domino effect of, you know, one thing leads to the next leads to the next. And by the time we realize what's going on, we have so much work to get back to where we were. Um, so I, I do see addressing from the naturopathic, the acupuncture, um, nutrition, all of those different aspects we need to for, for proper and for optimizing health overall. 
um, we can't we can't go at it from one direction only. As you mentioned, you know the the world is upside down right now. Obviously, um, so many people have just large amounts of stress, large amounts of fatigue, um, depression, anxiety. So there's so much now. What would you share? What can you share? Like you need to work on this first because you know as a patient comes in, the list sometimes is a lot, and it can become very overwhelming for the patient. So. You know, what do you say to your patient that comes in with, listen, my hormones are wonky, my nutrition is off the chart, I, I, I seem to be gaining weight, I sleep, and yet I'm still tired when I wake up. When somebody comes in with, you know, just a myriad of complaints, from your perspective, where should someone start first? And you know what, I see so many of these patients every day. Um, where, where I start with everyone is healing the foundations. I start at the gut level. I, I, I understand, you know, what their food intake is, what their drink intake is. And, and it's not about, and I know a lot of people come to natural health, they're like, oh, you're going to take away all the good food. You're going to make my life so much more miserable. And I'm like, well, no, your life is going to be better. Um, it's not about restrictions. What I like to start with, especially when we're burnt out, I don't like to remove more. I don't like causing restrictions unless there's literally something that red flag needs to be removed. Uh, I prefer to add in where we're missing some key nutrients and key key parts of our, our meals, right? So making sure we have proteins, fats, and our carb balance, um, making sure that they're eating you know, three meals a day at, at the very least, or two bigger meals. I know everyone, there's always back and forth what's ideal, but depending on their expenditure, I want to make sure that they're actually nourishing their body. Um, and so that's where I'm kind of, you know, starting first. And, uh, and then I address the gut, I, I try to reduce inflammation, because our immune system is in the gut, right? Mm -hmm. our, our immune system is there. And so I want to make sure that we're reducing inflammation, we're absorbing our nutrients, uh, we're creating our neurotransmitters, our vitamins are being created uh, down into the large intestine. I'm going to start there. Uh, and then we find ways to balance. I, I hate the word stress, and it's not stress. We're going to always have stress, but I look at ways we can adapt better to our environment. So I'll just uh, I'll address, you know, the stress. So I'll find ways, that, you know, I'll get them outside and walking or doing some sort of exercise or doing some sort of hobby they like as well. Like I'm a big person. I love puzzles. So I'll find ways to calm down by doing a puzzle or meditation and so on. So I always just kind of see what my patients do like to do uh, and what their interests are. Cause if they don't like running, I'm not going to ask them to run a marathon because that's not going to happen. Um, but I approach it from there, but I do, I start at the foundations and, and kind of most of my practice where I've, I've kind of put my energy is the five pillars of health right? We're looking at nutrition, we're looking at the gut, we're looking or gut and detox, we're looking at um, sleep and rest, but also movement, we're looking at hormonal balance, and then your mental emotional. So I'll go through those pillars, I'll see what pillar for that individual is very deficient or needs extra support, and start there. But it's usually the gut that I see is the most efficient, because people will feel better right away. Excellent. So if you can walk us through, what's it like when somebody comes to the clinic for the first time? How does somebody get in touch with you? Can you work outside of Canada where you're at? You know, what, what, do you, what can you do when somebody calls? Do you have programs that they can look at as well? So uh, for myself, I can practice and see patients within Ontario. So those who reside in Ontario. Um, I do plan to offer some online programs that can be accessed by individuals anywhere. Um, but right now for one-on-one -on -one type of care, uh, they'll, they'll be able to seek me out for those who live in Ontario. My initial visit, this is where I really get to know the person. So we sit down for about an hour and 15, maybe an hour and a half, depending on the individual. And we really, I really get to know them. Um, I like, you know, creating rapport with them, understanding their likes, their dislikes, what really brought them in, um, getting a health history, um, and really finding out what are their health goals. It might be back pain that brought them in or gut dysfunctions, but what are their true health goals? What do they want to be in, you know, three months, in six months, in 10 years, whatever it is. 
Um, and so that initial will give me a really clear idea of what's going on in terms of their current state um, and what they used to be and what they want to be. Um, and then from there, determine some tests that I may want to run or if they've already done testing, um, I can I can utilize those results. Uh, and then from there, we'll work through a program. And I've created a couple programs in my in my clinic, not so much as a set program because everything still stays individualized, but it kind of gives a guidance on how this is going to work out, right? What's the step A, step B, step C, and so on. Um, and so depending on what I find at the intake, maybe we're gonna start with gut program, or maybe we're gonna go straight into the hormones, or maybe we're gonna go straight into optimizing health because they're doing really well, but they wanna prevent disease. And so that's kind of how I'll do my assessments. Um, and then I'll utilize acupuncture. Um, I'm big on hydrotherapy and, um, and physical therapies. Um, so getting my hands on my patients, helping them physically feel better as well. Uh, and then also uh, nutritional kind of consults. Excellent. So talk a little bit about hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy. So it is utilizing water as therapy. Now there are a couple of variations that we can use, but one of my main treatment protocols is hot and cold water. So contrast hydrotherapy. Mm -hmm. I, I love sending my patients home with a handout. Simple. It's very simple to do. You just, and most of the time I let them know, just do it in the shower. You're in the shower ready. You can change the water temperature and you don't have to fill up any buckets and make it very difficult. And the idea here is we're introducing hot and cold water, uh, especially when we have physical complaints and pain, but it's also really great for immune wellness. It really stimulates the immune system. Um, and you're pretty much uh, covering the body with the hot water, followed by a cold, intense cold, but not to the point where it's painful. Um, jolt for about 30 seconds and then going back to hot and alternating hot and cold, hot and cold and ending on cold. Um, most of the time they tell me the first time they, they thought about, you know, never seeing me again because they hated it. But by the second and third time, they're like, this feels really great. Um, and it's just, it's, it's amazing because it helps with, you know, um, especially in case like, for example, if there's swelling in an injury. It helps with reducing swelling. It helps with taking kind of that waste material away. The heat will bring in nutrients and blood flow to the area to help it heal. I've done this so many times. I've rolled my ankles so many times when I used to play soccer and what, hydrotherapy was the way I went. Hot, cold, I would fill up two basins, soak my ankle in there, and, and then I would use homeopathy as well. But uh, hydrotherapy just uses hot, cold water and then you can get into variations with it and other tools with it as well, but it's fantastic and it's free. It's easy. Right, that's a good, good point. And it's free. And it's free. It's free. <laughs> Let me ask this. So you've been practicing for how long now? Uh, so I've been licensed and practicing for about three years, but I did graduate um, back for, from Bastyr in Seattle, Washington in 2012. Uh, and then I taught for two years. So then I came back and I did acupuncture. So I've been practicing technically for three years, but through clinical rotations, it's been almost like 10 years. I'm always interested on in how practitioners decided, hey, this is what I want to do. Do you remember that point in time? I remember as a, as a young child, I was so intrigued by my doctor. Like I was like, you're so cool. Like I was like, what they do is so amazing. Um, and as I grew up, I, you know, I still, I had very much interest in the body and health and wellness. And then, um, I have to commend my mother. She was one who was very much into natural therapies. Um, she went to many naturopaths, uh, and got a lot of support. And we, you know, I grew up with taking iron supplements and, you know, your, your natural supplements. And I just was like, well, maybe there's a type of medicine specific because as much as I want to be a doctor, I just don't know what area I would want to be in the regular allopathic Western medicine. And so I, I found out about the naturopathic schools and I was like, oh, this is perfect. I'm going to apply. And I love that I went to Bastyr because it was in the middle of a, a, the state forest. And it was like, you could walk down to the lake. And I was like, this is so cool. That's brilliant. It's nice. Is yeah, right? it was amazing. Excellent. So as we wind up tonight, can you leave us with like, Listen, here are the three action tips. If you're going to do anything, please do these three things. What would you say they are? Oh, one, I, I, as, I, as I sigh, breathe. Okay. I think we really need to, uh, to work on breathing. Breathing into our belly 
taking time to breathe in and out and really just sit with yourself for a couple moments throughout the day. Uh, the second one is create, you know, um, create goals and not goals, create uh, habits. Sorry, that's the word I was looking for. Create habits, um, whether it's going to be waking up a bit earlier in the morning, um, getting some sort of movement in, create some healthy habits, drink a glass of water when you first wake up, right? Followed by a little bit of movement. You don't have to go to the gym for 10 hours. Just do some sort of moving. Skip rope, stretch, um, go through some physical exercise from YouTube, whatever it is. But create this healthy habits in the morning that really get your day started. Um, and then just nourish your body. Make sure you're eating for your body. You know, don't skip meals. Um, don't overeat in one setting. Um, eat. You know, and don't feel bad for what you're eating, but be smart about the food choices. I think, you know, we'll have our days where we crave something that we know is not healthy. Uh, you know, the definition there will, we'll, I can always pick at, but enjoy it. But it also just nourish your body. Choose foods that are going to bring nourishment to your body and make sure that it's, you know, your plate is full of colors. Excellent. Beautiful. Thank you. I like that. Quite <laughs> a lot. That's excellent. All right. Can you share with everybody your website name, please? Yes. So, <laughs> so it's uh, Igea Naturopathic Clinic. So Hygia, um, H-Y-G-E-I-A, naturopathicclinic.com. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at Dr. F.E. Germanis N.D. Or sorry, doc, yeah, Dr. D.R. F.E. Germanis N.D. Excellent. Very cool. So thank you very much tonight. I appreciate all your time. Um, give me a second here and then I will speak to you. Perfect. Thank you again. Thank you.